Good morning. Um, so, uh, sorry for the slightly late start for people that are here at nine. I think there was some confusion about whether it would be nine or 9.30. So we have waited till 9.30 to give people a bit more time. Um, so uh, thanks for coming along. Uh, we've got uh, another great talk from the Epicense uh, project uh, this morning. So uh, Francesca, I don't know if your computer's coming on. Oh yeah. Uh, Francesca is, is from the uh, University of College London uh, group uh, with Neil Burgess uh, and I think uh, though she started in the University of Napoli, is that right? She's been at UCL since doing her PhD yeah, with, um, with Neil, uh, with John O'Keefe. So, uh, uh, and I think she's carved out a particular niche for herself both within that group and within the international hippocampus community by focusing uh, on aspects of development of hippocampus. And so uh, that's a, a significant gap in, in what we've covered so far in the summer school. Uh, so I think uh, it, today's a great opportunity to understand a bit more about uh, how this really important and fascinating brain structure uh, comes to develop in, in animals and that will, should give us some new insights, I think, to its role in spatial and episodic memory. Francesca. Let me just say hello and thanks for coming here. And for I think I need to switch this off, right? No? Okay, everything is fine. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so sorry for starting a bit uh, later. Um, and thanks to Tony for the introduction. So, first of all, can you all hear me with the microphone and everything? Yes. So, uh, what I would like to do with this lecture, and I don't know if it's going to be one hour or, or an hour and a half. What should it be? Uh, okay. I'll talk, and then when I see all the eyes going like the going glazed, <laughs> then I will just stop. And oh. so I, I want to make this very, very interactive, if possible. Uh, so I'm very happy to accept questions throughout uh, the lecture. Yeah. Uh, don't make me speak because I can speak forever and ever, and I like the sound of my own voice, and I start talking calmly, and I have a thick Italian accent, and then yes, I go on talking very, very fast, and it becomes incomprehensible. So you just stop me and ask me questions. That's the trick. As Tony said, what we will talk about today uh, is the core of the focus of the research in my lab, which is uh, on the development of the spatial representations in the hippocampus. And you've had wonderful introductions about the hippocampus spatial systems from Edvard Moser and from Neil as well. So I won't dwell too much on the introduction, but please, again, if I'm not explaining basic concepts uh, enough, please stop me and ask me questions. Okay, so I don't need to dwell on the fact that the hippocampus uh, in, in humans is buried within the temporal lobes is this structure here, which resembles a seahorse, and that's where it, its name comes from. But to, today we will be mainly focusing on the uh, homologous structures in, structure in the rat, in the rodent. And this is what it looks like. It's this big red cashew nut-like uh, structure, uh, which is very prominent and very big with respect to the rest of the, of the brain. And in uh, uh, green here, these are uh, uh, MRI uh, reconstructed, volumetric reconstructed uh, brains fr from rats. In green is the entorhinal cortex, which represents the cortical the bit of the cortex uh, which channels all information from the rest of the cortical mantle to the then reaches through the internal cortex, the hippocampus itself. So this is the gateway of the hippocampus, uh, of cortical information for it to reach the hippocampus. And we know that the main functions that the hippocampus uh, has are two. One is spatial, uh, spatial navigation, and this uh, idea comes all the way back uh, to uh, Tolman, Edward Tolman, who introduced the idea that uh, animals possess representations and spatial representations, flexible representations of, their, of the spatial layout 
uh, of the environments that they encounter and navigate through. Uh, and it was John O'Keefe and, uh, and uh, Lynn Nadell who decided and uh, put forward this theory that this function of holding mental representations uh, was uh, basically uh, down to the uh, functionality of the hippocampus throughout the vertebrae group. And then we know, of course, from the work uh, of Scovin and Milner uh, that the, in humans, the hippocampus seems to have acquired this other function, which is supporting episodic memories, memories of which have a specific uh, spatial but also temporal context attached to them. Uh, and so without hippocampus in humans, not only you get lost, for instance, in the first stages of Alzheimer's disease, but also uh, more prominently, uh, you uh, lose the ability to form new episodic memories. Okay, so all the data that I will be showing during this talk refers to, uh, yes, it refers to single neuron recordings, extracellular recordings, where we put electrodes in the brain of rodents, and in particular we focus on rats, because this is our model system, and then we get uh, rats to walk around in these minimalistic uh, environments, uh, and we can record the activity of single neurons, be it in the hippocampal, hippocampus or beyond the hippocampal formation, while the animal walks around in these environments. And, and basically, this is the basic phenomenon that convinced John O'Keefe many years ago in the early 70s that the hippocampus had something to do with space, and this is the place cell. Okay, so when you record the activity of single neurons in region CA1, and this is a horizontal section of a rat brain, uh, and you get animals to a rat to walk around in the environment, you will see that each cell will fire spikes in a specific location in this environment and only in that location, and this is called the place field of the environment. So basically, uh, place cells represent, um, uh, encode the location of the organism. And they have been found in region CA1 and also CA3 in the hippocampus proper. Then there are head direction cells, which are uh, neurons which also encode a spatial uh, property of the environment. And in particular, they respond to whenever uh, the animal points its head in a specific direction. Uh, these cells are not sensitive to the magnetic field, and yet they work uh, like a compass in the brain. So they provide information about in which direction the animal is pointing its head. And they have been uh, mainly described in rodents, but also in bats uh, recently. And in terms of where they, are, they can be recorded, within the hippocampal formation, they can be recorded in the presubiculum, parasubiculum, and the entorhinal cortex, medial entorhinal cortex. Uh, but also, head direction cells are basically present throughout an extended network of brain areas, which include uh, thalamic areas, the anterior thalamus, but also hypothalamic areas, lateral mammillary nucleus, uh, all the way back into the brain stem, where uh, they have a, this, net, this uh, neural network has strong, strong interactions with the vestibular system. Uh, and uh, so, while place cells encode the location of the organism in the environment, head direction cells basically tell you which way you're facing, okay, when you want to, in, uh, to interpret a map, basically. And then, of course, grid cells, which were discovered in the lab of Edward and Maybrit Moser, uh, and that uh, can be recorded from the entorhinal cortex and pre and parasubiculum. And these grid cells, unlike place cells, possess multiple foci of activity, each grid cell. And the beautiful thing is that they are arranged in this. Uh, exquisite regular lattice uh, with uh, each peak uh, is present at the apexes of equilateral triangles and so there are many theories of what these grid cells might be doing. I'm sure Edward has gone through this at, at length. Some people think that they may be encoding distance traveled and in particular they might be important in what is called vector navigation, so cal calculating your route to a specific uh, goal location. But the truth is, is that so far we have no real strong experimental proof that any of these functions are subserved by the grid cells. So it's still uh, interesting and exciting work that needs to be done on grid cells and in particular and in general on all of these spatial signals. Okay, so the focus of this lecture, as promised, will be on the development of this spatial Maybe machine. Before we now go here. Yeah. So you gave us a bit, the quick overview yeah. of the hippocampus. And now first, for in the HM case, 
Um, actually, there, there's, there's a lot of doubt about how we should interpret the HM results because it turns out that the lesions were not complete for the hippocampus and actually also covering other areas of the brain, like the amygdala. Moreover, there has been some doubt about the actual neuropsychological assessment that was done on him, and there was this idea about bias in the assessment and so on. So we always use HM like, oh yeah, this made everything clear. But actually it's not. So, so what's the convincing evidence for you that we can really say like, oh, hippocampus is the episodic and declarative memory? What is the convincing yes, what evidence? Is, what closes that case that we can really say, okay, it's established, we're done, hippocampus is really localizing that specific function of episodic memory. I think it's not just HM, it's just the cumulative evidence from patients and also in Alzheimer's disease, you mean specifically for episodic memory as opposed to any other sort of memory. Yeah. And are you referring in particular about the debate whether it is declarative memory or specifically episodic memory or just in general yeah, if it's instance, a... I mean, we have, we have doubts. Yes. Because now we all present like, oh, it's clear, but it's not. Can, can I just doubts. shoot myself in the foot? Please, okay, shoot yourself. Let's okay. shoot the right never mind, yeah, never mind the HM and episodic memory, which... So the difficulty there is that we don't have an animal model for episodic memory. So that, that's the real trouble because you don't have access to ways in which you can manipulate uh, the, the circuit and ask the animal whether it can produce or not this episodic memory. So that's the real Achilles heel. But what I was referring to in terms of shooting myself in the foot is this Tolman's, the idea that these animals possess cognitive maps as Tolman mm -hmm. thought about them. Because the... The, and, and, and so that, that's interesting to go through this at this stage very early on because then we can discuss this more. So the, the, the basic, uh, one of the basic kind of pivotal findings that, that Tolman uh, made at the time was that animals can navigate through shortcuts. So they find um, a route blocked and they can, uh, if they have a hippocampus which is intact, then they can basically navigate to the goal through a new novel uh, route. And that's the kind of litmus test for whether animals possess or not cognitive maps. And people will know that this is very difficult to replicate, okay? This idea that animals can take shortcuts is quite tricky. Mm -hmm. So the, the pillars of this whole discourse about right. hippocampus in spatial and episodic memory role are a bit shaky, mm -hmm. okay? What is not shaky, I think, is all this, so the neural machinery. And uh, yes. But there's a second tricky bit yeah. now for HM because we also know that HM had no problems recalling events that happened prior to the lesion. Yes, right? the retrograde uh, deficit. Okay. So yeah. recall. And so that means if we think about episodic memory in terms of acquisition, retention, and expression, yeah. we cannot localize that whole thing inside hippocampus. We have to start to include other structures. There is a huge controversy about this as well, whether the hippocampus has a, just a temporary lo uh, role, so only in encoding when you make your memories. And, uh, so for instance, uh, people like Larry Squire would think, and a uh, strong proponent of the idea that the hippocampus is important to make your memories at the very beginning, but then these memories are transferred to the cortex. And so eventually, uh, that's why the very old memories are always preserved because they're safe in the cortex. Uh, while the hippocampus is all important momentarily. Uh, instead, they had some other people like Nadel, Moscovich, and so on and so forth. They think instead that the hippocampus is always important because they, they think that the hippocampus, at a minimum, for the spatial and episodic memories in particular, always acts as an index, at a minimum. It needs to basically point to the different neurons in the cortex that are, are actually making up the memory. Right. So, uh, and I think on, on that basis, and again, we are, the difficulty there is that there is no animal model, and so you cannot do interventional prospective studies. You only have this kind of fuzzy stuff about patients and the localization of the, 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 the trauma and the damage is very tricky and so on and so forth, but I think there is evidence. Patients for VC, for instance, patient TT, all sorts of different patients which show that when you have a specific damage to the hippocampus, your retrograde um, amnesia is, is flat, okay? There is no gradient. You cannot recall any personal autobiographical memories 
without a, a functioning hippocampus. Right. So, but it is a contro controversial area. Exactly. And I think the problem is that we don't have access to the circuit to make mm -hmm. kind of experiments where you switch it off or on a wheel, yeah. and specifically, and because episodic memory cannot be studied. I mean, there are people who have tried and attempted this in, in animals, but it is much more tricky because we're basically relying on verbal uh, report, right? Exactly. And the idea is that, yes, there are some, maybe it is specific to humans. True, yeah. Okay. So let's go on to the what will be the core uh, of, of this lecture, which is basically about how that spatial machinery, grid cells, head direction cells, place cells, how do they come about? Because if you think about it, these are very high order, high level cognitive representations we're talking about. What is a place? What is a direction? Uh, how is, what does it mean that a, a neuron encodes location or a neuron encodes direction? How do they do this? Uh, it is very, these are very complicated constructs that even like uh, when you discuss them, they're very complicated. So how do they come about? What, what are the sensory, what is the sensory information that impinges onto these neurons or these networks and makes them react? Uh, in the way that we have seen, place, uh, having place, uh, displaying place fields or grid fields or uh, polar plots here, head direction uh, fields. So this is the real open question. So I'm very happy that John and Maybrit and Edward get, got the Nobel Prize when they got the Nobel Prize, but the real Nobel Prize, I think, for me is for the person who understands truly how these representations are, are formed. Okay, how does really literally from the periphery to the, to the hippocampus, how does a place cell, how is it built? Okay, and one way in which we can hope to try and address this question is by looking at how the brain does it during development, because that's precisely what happens. Uh, you, you start from a few cells and then you divide and so on and so forth, and then you get, uh, you, you, you need to, uh, build a network that produces eventually your spatial responses. And in particular, there has been a strong philosophical kind of debate about whether uh, knowledge, uh, wh where, you, where you come to the world, your mind is a blank slate, so the empiricist camp, which says that everything is learned through experience. So you come to the world, your brain comes to the world as a kind of just a, a mush of neurons, I mean, putting it into kind of neurobiological uh, language, and then everything needs to be learned through what the sensory uh, inputs tell you. And instead, people like uh, Immanuel Kant here, they suggested instead that this is not possible, that you wouldn't be able to make sense of all this sensory barrage of information without having already a pre-existent structure, okay, and categories of knowledge, which he called space and time. So without having a sense of what space and time are, you won't be able to order this uh, information, sensor information, you won't be able to make sense of it. And so according to Kant here, space and time must be pre-existing, must be innate, let's say, let's use this very difficult uh, term, term fraught with, um, complexity. So if Kant is right and the empiricists were wrong, what we should see is that as soon as we can record the activity of these neurons in the brain, we should be able to see the full complement, place cells, grid cells, head direction cells, because indeed they represent the scaffold, the special scaffold that uh, Kant was saying is an a priori, uh, a priori uh, category of uh, knowledge. And more specifically what my hopefully my lecture will try and delve into, is what are the key sensory inputs that support the development of the special attuned neurons and which aspects are more experience dependent or independent. And uh, I'm going to divide the information into the three different kind of, uh, three different uh, subtopics. One about what are the environmental features support place cell firing. Then we will discuss head direction cells. And then we will delve into the memory system. Okay, so how does this hippocampus start becoming a memory system? Okay, so first of all, let me introduce you to our model system, which is the rat. And uh, I don't expect any of you, but 
please correct me if I'm wrong, to have spent lots and lots of time with these little ones. So I will just want to tell you what they look like. Uh, rats throughout the period that we're interested in. So we're interested in the first, first four weeks of life of the rat. This P stands for postnatal, so zero is day zero when they're born, and then this is day 28. Okay, so rats, I argue, are a pretty good model for the development also uh, of uh, humans because they're an altricial species, which means that when they're born, they're pretty hopeless creatures like humans, and they need to learn uh, to sense their environment and also to move. And this, this, uh, there is a de definitely protracted sensory motor development. Rats are even worse than human babies because complete, at birth they're completely blind and their eyelids unfuse, so they, their eyelids open uh, when they are 15 days old. If you think that uh, rats are weaned, so they become their independent life, they start their independent life when they are 21 days old, you can see how long after birth the eyes open. Uh, it is a substantial kind of delay, so vision uh, uh, appears quite late in the development of the rat. And also in terms of their motor uh, coordination, they go through all the steps like we human infants go through. At the beginning, they do this pivoting, which is just moving the head. Then they do the crawling, and then they start their quadrupedal walking when they are around 14, 15 days old. Okay, uh, and at birth, the, in terms of which sensory, uh, they have a kind of rudimentary vestibular system and olfactory systems. Uh, but also auditory uh, development. Uh, the auditory meatus doesn't open until they are 13 days old, and so on. Okay, in terms of spatial behavior, which is what interests us, when do they uh, kind of start uh, moving and exploring their surroundings? So at the beginning, for the first two weeks of life, they can be thought of as couch potatoes. They really spend all their time inside the nest uh, and they swim inside these huddles with their uh, siblings. And they, in, in uh, the wild, and this depends, of course, on ambient temperature and all sorts of other factors, they won't even uh, go outside this nest, so exploring the, the wide uh, environment, until they are 19, 20 days old. In the, in the laboratory, because we make our laboratories very nice, uh, they start leaving their nest when they are 16 days old. Okay? There are fewer predators and the, the, it's warmer than in some places where rats, wild rats, rats live. So around 16 days old, let's say. But true exploration, and this is work that has been done by Lynn Nadell, doesn't emerge until they are around 20, 21 days old. So coincidentally with the time we usually basically uh, wean the animals in the laboratory. I'm talking about laboratory rats. So this is true spatial exploration. And Lynn noticed that he did very careful work that this, uh, the onset of exploration, so this transition from uh, couch potatoes to uh, little Indiana Jones, happens overnight in each pup. And this is very interesting because whenever you see a critical change in development, it tells you that something must have happened all of a sudden to allow that new uh, function uh, to appear. So exploration appears uh, suddenly, but when you try and test um, uh, rats, young rats, on the typical test that one uses to, uh, to assess the hippocampal function uh, in adult rats, so the water maze or the spatial T maze alternation task or Y maze, all sorts of tasks, the classical tasks one use, uses, the, the pups don't manage to solve any of these tasks until they are 21 days old or old, older. So it is really uh, during the fourth week that gradually uh, they become able to solve the, that their hippocampus becomes capable of uh, supporting navigation. Now I want to put this in the context of what happens to humans. And for those of you who are interested, I have a coda on human spatial development. If you're interested, and if we will have time to cover that. But in general, so uh, of course, this is very difficult to do. It's an exercise that is bound to fail. But just to give you an idea of where people have drawn parallels between uh, rat and infant, human infant development. Uh, so in, in a rat which is around 9, 10, 11 days old would 
correspond to a human around 9 to 12 months, which is when humans start acquiring the crawling, the independent movement. And it seems that in, uh, in when you look at the development of memory uh, encoding in humans, there might be some, some people uh, argue that there is a transition to flexible memory uh, around 9 to 12 months old. And that might be due to the fact that uh, children start being able to move across the rooms and around objects and see things from different perspectives. Okay? So people who are really enamored with this idea that spatial concepts uh, are important for memory uh, formation, that's what they argue, is that the mobility of the infant then spurs these new flexible memories to be formed. And then animals around the beginning of their uh, when they are 16 to 17 days old, would correspond to humans around two, two and a half years old. But there is a, a consensus, and two, and two and a half years old is when most of us can recall our first, what we call episodic memories, okay? Things that have occurred to us. Now, interestingly, as adults, you can only recall memories when you were from, uh, the earliest memories are when you are on average two, two and a half, three years old. But if you ask a child, five, six years old, to recall when, when was your earliest memory. They recall some memories from when they were even younger than one year old. And this is corroborated by the parents and so on and so forth, I mean, as much as you can corroborate it. So it seems that the ability to form episodic memory is already there. It's just that you lose the ability maybe to recall them later. But interestingly, and there is a strong consensus about this, it is when, uh, when children are around five to seven years old that they can definitely form long-lasting episodic memories, okay? And that there is a total consensus. So this would basically correspond to the period after weaning in the rat. So there is a parallel between this phenomena in the rat and in the humans. Okay, so now let's look at what we have done. So what we have done is to record the activity of the spatial neurons in the rats across this temporal window and even earlier. But in our first study, which now is, uh, uh, appeared long, long time ago, we recorded the activity of neurons in the entorhinal cortex and in, the, uh, in CA1 in the hippocampus uh, in animals that were 16 days uh, old or older. And uh, we basically established the basic timeline of emergence of these signals. And what we discovered was that the head direction cells are the first, so these compass cells are the first to be uh, present. Okay? When we recorded them in animals that are 16 days old, these are animals which have just opened their eyes, rats that have just opened their eyes, uh, they're already there. And they're there and they're mature and they work as well as in the adult animals. And this was very surprising. So the compass in the brain is the first to appear. And then we looked at place cells in the hippocampus and this uh, showed a very gradual, so there were some place cells in animals as young as 16 days old, but they were fuzzier and less stable than the ones you see in the adult. And they show a kind of um, monotonic increase in their kind of stability and their uh, preci uh, precision and resolution. What really surprised us at the time uh, was that the grid cells, they appeared a whole week after head direction cells were already up and working. And they uh, appeared in a kind of quite dramatic and abrupt uh, fashion when the animals were around 21 days old, okay, around weaning. So what was quite surprising at the time is that because grid cells had been discovered just five years before, and because grid cells are placed in the entorhinal cortex, which as I said, is at the input end, so channels all information to the hippocampus, and it's not the other way around. So everybody was thinking at the time that grid cells must be the input, the building blocks of place cells. So when this data came out, it was the first data that really showed that the relationship between grid cells and place cells wasn't this simple. It is not possible that grid cells, at least in development, uh, are inputs to place cells because we could find place cells in the young animals when we couldn't find grid cells yet. And then there has been accumulating evidence that indeed the relationship between these two cell types is more complicated and it is two-way at least. Okay, so this is the basic timeline. And then... Doctor, you say something? Yeah, yeah sure. <coughs> so... Um, you show a gradual emergence of the place cells mm -hmm. from, from uh, postnatal 16. 
but I'm sure it will not be that sort of linear. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So can you say something more specifically about the, let's say, the propensity of these play cells to develop in that period, and also whether they have all the features you see in the play cells? That's what we will talk animal. about now in detail. So okay, if you give me one, yeah, okay. yeah, okay. So and indeed, that's what we'll talk about is specifically about the development of places in more detail. And then if I don't answer your questions, then you... I'll remind yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so here, uh, this is data from that original publication, just to show you what these display cells look like in di at different ages uh, during development. So these are recorded from animals that are 16 days old. So this is a map of... These are maps of four different cells, representative cells, and we always show two trials. So the way in which the experiment goes is that we put an animal for 10, 15 minutes in this square box, we let them explore the environment, then we take them out for 10, 15 minutes to rest, and then we put them back in in the second trial. And this allows us to, to uh, try and probe not only uh, how kind of the spatial resolution of the map during one single experience, trial one, but also how reliable this is, okay? Do the animals know that they're in the same box and they're specifically in the same place? When, when you, uh, with gaps of 10, 15 minutes between trials. And as you can see, uh, these play cells here are, uh, they're already kind of spatially restricted firing, um, but this is not as uh, crisp and as um, selective as in the adult, okay, when they are 16 to 17 days old. And also their reliability is not as beautiful as in the adult, okay? I don't have, I think, the population data the, uh, to show the special information and special stability, which will show kind of this linear, almost linear. I thought I had it, but I don't think I have. What we notice, though, is that whenever you look uh, more detail, uh, hundreds and hundreds of plots like this, even in the youngest animals, you always find some place cells which are in the very young animals, when they're 14 even, they sold 15, 16 days old, they're as beautiful and as nice uh, as in the adult. Of course, this is part of the distribution one thinks, uh, there will be some bad ones at the other end of the distribution. But what we noticed, what uh, one postdoc in my PhD student in, at the time in my lab noticed, is that these place fields never occur in the middle of the environment. And the nice place fields are always against the edges. And so in order to bring out this phenomenon uh, in a kind of quantitative um, way, what we did was simply add all the firing of all the cells, or all the maps that we recorded in any given session, and uh, this is the kind of map we came up with. So the firing of place cells is accumul accumulates against the edges of the environment in young animals. And uh, this is the whole map, but in order to enhance this and to see it more clearly, what we did was divide the environment in four quadrants, superimpose the four quadrants. And so now all the boundaries, the edges of the environment are here, and all the bits of the center of the environment are there. And as you can see, in pre winling animals, animals that are younger than uh, 21 day days, the firing is accumulating, uh, accumulates against the edges of the environment. This is not true in post winling animals. And moreover, in the adult, actually, the opposite is true, that there is more firing in the center of the environment than at the edges. And this is just the quantitative analysis to show that, indeed, the statistics agrees with this qualitative assessment of these maps. So there is a specific concentration of firing of place self-firing against the edges of the environment in young animals before weaning. And what's even more interesting is that if you look at the stability, so how reliable the firing of place cells is um, in young animals and at all ages, in young animals specifically, so before weaning, the uh, place fields which have place cells which have place fields against the edges of the environment are more stable than ones whose place fields are kind of marooned in the middle of the environment. Okay, so it's as if they're unhinged, and so they are less stable. And this, so there is a correlation which is kind of hard. Uh, it's, uh, it's it was a surprising result. There is a quite a nice correlation. Uh, between um, place field stability and the distance from wall. So here is the, um, how distant, how far from the wall uh, the place fields are on the x-axis and on the y-axis is how stable. And as you can see, these lines, which are significant correlations, uh, regressions, are significant only until the animals are 20 to 21 days old. 
So the more I'm closer to an edge, the higher my stability and reproducibility, but only if I'm young. If I transition through this kind of magical threshold of, of winning, this relationship doesn't hold anymore, and it certainly doesn't hold in the adult. So what this data is telling us is that basically place cell maps are uh, developed from outside in when you put it, uh, animals in this kind of environments, yes? And that boundaries represent very important spatial features uh, that support early uh, place uh, cell firing. But wait, yeah. you yeah. could also argue that it develops from proximal to distal sensing because close to walls have my whisker system yeah. and in the center I only have vision. So did you try this with clipped whiskers? No, but we, what we, we tried was and we will try, is to try and do maybe some lidocaine on the whisker pad or something like that. This is absolutely... But you agree, right? This yeah, absolutely. Interpretation. Yeah, that's why I, uh, my sentence exactly was when you put animals in this kind of environments. Mm -hmm. So if we put them with environments with objects in, maybe this will not but hold. That because the yeah. concept of outside in yes. is a contention that it's one way to look at the data, but it's not the only way to look at the data. Absolutely. Right? So it could be, yes, in this kind of minimalistic environment. So yes, sensing. indeed. It's, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So when you have only the boundaries to, to work with, mm -hmm. of course, it's outside in. Right. Yeah? But it's really important, right? Yeah. Because it also means, at this stage, this initial surprise, like, oh, grid cells are after play cells, should now also be taken with a grain of salt because the play cells that emerged early on are not really like play cells yet. They're, they're sort of a subset of play cells that are more tied to Absolutely. proximal sensing. Right? Absolutely. So it's less spectacular than it initially looked. Yes, and it, it, I would put it in the other way in the sense that this kind of work then illuminates or enlightens what the grid cells might be there for, indeed. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is dissecting what it is to be a play cell because People talk about place cells, and but the place re true place response needs to have lots of characteristics. It's not just a blob on a, on a firing rate right. map. Mm -hmm. So it has right. to have the exactly, absolutely. So can you say something about the view dependence of these early place cells? Uh, not really, okay. not really. Uh, so we have looked at whether they are omnidirectional, mm -hmm. meaning uh, whenever the animal comes from different, and they are omnidirectional. Okay. So they're not directional sensitive. And this is as much as we can do with this kind of data. Right. Yeah. Okay, so many years ago, Neil Burgess was given a lecture uh, a couple of days ago, I think here, um, proposed this boundary vector cell model of place cell firing. So did he talk about this model? Yeah, he did. Okay, yeah. so I don't need to talk about this. This is his kind of, he's very proud of this model, and I think it's, it's an interesting history. That's why I, I produce it. So at the time when grid cells, this is my take on it, at the time when grid cells were not, uh, hadn't been discovered yet, people were wondering what are the building blocks of place cells. Uh, and I was doing my PhD with John O'Keefe at the time, and Neil had, together with Tom Hartley, had this idea that maybe the building blocks of place cells could be these boundary vector cells which are these cells that uh, have receptor fields at a specific allocentric distance and direction from prominent boundaries, okay? These could be objects, this could be, in particular, they, they were thought of as boundaries. And that if you do a thresholded sum of all these boundary vector cells, which were just modeling uh, entities at the time, you, you could come up with place cells. And that was the idea of this, this model explain what are the, the fundamental building blocks of place cells in, in a world where grid cells did not exist yet. And we tested uh, all sorts of things, I mean, played around with different uh, environmental shapes and so on, to see whether place cells could be, the behavioral place cells could be accounted for by this kind of model. Now, in a very interesting twist of uh, turn of events, what happens is that cells whose firing might be like those boundary vector cells, actually turned out to exist. And this is quite funny and interesting because I challenge any modeler to uh, have like uh, kind of foreseen the presence of things that might resemble their model. This seldomly happens, so I'm very uh, happy. And Neil, I think, is very proud of this model. So boundary vector, boundary responsive cells, or cells that look like boundary vector cells, have been discovered both in the internal cortex, they've been called border cells by the, the mosers, and in the subiculum, both at the input and the output end of the hippocampus. 
And if we look at the development, so if these are the building blocks of place cells, in, uh, in any animal uh, before weaning uh, who doesn't have functioning and stable grid cell firing, maybe these are the cells that are supporting the firing of the early place cells. And indeed, if you look at the development of these boundary responsive cells, both in the subiculum, and this is our own uh, still unpublished work, and in the enteranal cortex, the border cells, they're already present in young animals. So maybe that's what is happening, and this is the interpretation of the data that I prefer, is that in, during early development it is these boundary cells which very likely are supported by sensory uh, information and proximal sensory information uh, that are supporting early place maps, and that's why we see them developing from outside in. Uh, in these kind of environments. And then when, when uh, grid cells appear, and they appear abruptly, as I said, around 21, when the animals are 21 days old, you see the place maps filling in, basically. Also, uh, place cells in the middle of the environment uh, are as stable as the ones at the edges of the environment. So maybe what this data is telling us is suggesting that one of the functions of grid cells is indeed to extend the spatial capabilities of our mapping system, the place cell mapping system, to feature less to areas in the environment which are further away from uh, sensory uh, cues. And so this is the, the power that grid cells uh, confer to the place mapping system. Okay, so now a little uh, digression into the field of neurodegeneration. This is just because a uh, few years ago, there was this paper in Science where this is a human uh, study uh, where uh, this group was looking at uh, humans who carry uh, the ApoE4 um, uh, uh, ApoE4 uh, gene, which if you have two copies of this uh, ApoE4, you're at uh, consider considerable higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease later on in your life. And what they were doing here, they were uh, testing both uh, high, so uh, ApoE4 high risk uh, AD, uh, completely healthy subjects at this st uh, stage of their lives uh, with control participants on a task uh, where, where the uh, participants were required uh, to uh, navigate in this featureless arena. This is very much like one of these cylindrical environments where we put our rats in when we record place cells. And what uh, the participants were required to do was to just retrieve objects. So there were objects dropped in specific locations and then they needed to uh, remember where, where these objects had been dropped. Okay, and while this happens, of course, there's, uh, the fMRI uh, scans of their brains are required. And uh, a few years ago, um, one of the authors of this study, together with Caswell Barry and Neil Burgess, had seen that uh, there is a specific signature of grid cell-like firing in the internal cortex that you can pull up out of fMRI uh, data. And what happens is that when you look at this in these participants, you see that grid cell-like signaling is quite reduced uh, in, in the at-risk participants. The humans who are completely healthy, yes? Is that during navigation or during planning or preparation? I think this is during the navigation stage. Right. Yeah? Because okay. Because you were referring to the previous slide, the vision studies have been like both from the white blood lab and from the motor lab. Yeah. They've been showing that you actually do not really depend on either grid cells or background or you know, specific inputs and you still maintain, I mean, there is a slightly decrease spatial uh, stability. Yeah, but th that's exactly what the previous question is about. So when we see a place cell and a place field that looks okay, but we need to really test it further to try and understand what are the sensory features that are supporting that firing. Are they the same as in the absence of grid cell? So yes, indeed, the basic phenomenon is preserved without grid. Now we know, we know you do lesions, you do pharmacological intervention, you silence them. You don't need grid cells to get these places, but do they function in the same way? 
or what have you taken away from the place cells? So for instance, when you do maximal injections in the, in the septum, and so you remove theta, uh, and what happens is that when you put animals in novel environments, these are adult rats, they only form place, place fields at the edges, this is Wang et al., uh, at the edges of the environment, okay? So in novel environments. Well, if they're familiar environments, they're fine, because they can retrieve, presumably, the, uh, the synaptic connective connection, let's say, uh, of whatever had been already encoded. So maybe grid cells are important to, for setting up place maps in places, locations far, far away from obvious sensory landmarks. Maybe, okay, so that's the interpretation that, uh, of the, all the data, not just my data, but all the data that is around at the moment. Okay, so during navigation, these subjects have a kind of weaker grid cell signaling, okay? Uh, although they have, if you test them in any other way, uh, they're totally fine and they can do the task, they can perform the task at the same level, okay? They don't have any problems. And at the behavioral level, the only thing that uh, the authors could, uh, could notice in the pattern of behavior is that the at-risk uh, group uh, have a preference to navigate against the edges of the environment. So they don't want to go in the center of the arena. They have a slight thing. Um, no, no, okay. I don't know if that's informative. Don't, yeah. don't forget, right? That's this is just a curious thing in, in the data. In environments, also rats will, will, will do tick taxes. They will tend to navigate along. Yes, yes, but this is with respect to the control group, yeah? So the control group doesn't show this tendency yeah, but of avoiding. Yeah. It might not be telling us very much about hippocampal processing. Mm -hmm. It might tell us more about the, in the, the execution of a stereotype behavior that's already encoded at a much more primitive level, which is in an unknown environment, stick to the walls. Yes, but why is it that this environment is more unknown in the at-risk group than in the control group? Well, the risk so that, group that's the question, yeah. So what is, uh, what is going... problems with, uh, say, perceptual processing, uh, integration of different features, Sense. Yes, right. yes, but that also may be th that kind of problem. So that's why I, at the very beginning of the lecture I said the Nobel Prize really is for the person who tells us how you integrate all these sensory features and come up with a place cell or a grid cell. This is the interesting question because we're basically discussing the same thing. So we're, say we're saying the same thing, I think, that it may be in this at risk individuals what's going wrong is all this perceptual integration. Mm -hmm. And that is reflected also higher level at the grid cell, in the grid cell impairment. Yeah? So it's, but, but you're saying where in the, in the processing stream the defect arises. Mm -hmm. From this data we cannot tell. No, I'm just saying, yeah. what's, how is this informative yeah. with respect to hippocampal memory processing? This is what's my question, right? Because we say, well, I can come up with an alternative, like, Okay, these people are messed up, perceptual processing, um, path integration, the, 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 let's say the time constants of integration, uh, so synaptic processing is affected. So now you start to fall back on more reactive behaviors and that would explain panel D. Right? Yeah. Yes. So then this is as such not informative about hippocampal memory. That, so that's my challenge to you. Yes, I mean, to me it is informative of hippocampal functioning because it tells us at a minimum that there is possibly a link between these two phenomena, okay? Now, could it be which one comes first, okay? Is it because they don't travel in the center that they have grid cell kind of problems or is it the grid cell, so what the authors want to argue is that the grid cell uh, impairment results then causes the behavioral impairment, okay? Yeah. That's what they want to argue. I don't even know that that's the case. Right. I don't know which way this goes, mm -hmm. whether the impairment is it's coming. It's a more complex interpretation, yeah. right? The simple interpretation is in unknown environments, or let's say if there's high stress and arousal, you do take more taxes, you stick to walls, done. Yes, right. and it, it could be that. So I don't need grid cells, I don't need anything to explain it. Absolutely, and it could be that your grid cell problems stand from the fact that you're against the edges all the time in your life, yeah, let's no. say. Yeah, no, absolutely, yes, and, and indeed, I don't argue that either of these, so yeah, yeah, Basically. either of these interpretations can stand to scrutiny. Okay. So what we did when we looked at this and with just our curiosity was uh, kind of uh, uh, aroused 
is that we looked at some data that I had acquired many, many years ago during a postdoc in John O'Keefe's lab uh, on a model, now an ancient model, of uh, amyloid accumulation in the brain. This is the TG2576 mouse model, and at the time we were recording the activity of place cells in young and aged uh, transgenic animals. These animals accumulate lots of amyloid and eventually are unable, their hippocampus cannot cope and they're unable to solve special tasks and so on and so forth. And what we notice is that these aged transgenic an animals, the, um, the, the amyloid burden, so the amount of amyloid that is accumulated in their hippocampus, uh, correlates inversely both with the behavioral performance on a teammate's alternation task, but also with the kind of spatial information the place cells. Okay, so the worse you, uh, the, the more amyloid you have, the worse your hippocampus works, both at the, uh, the neural level, so place cells gets worse, but also your behavior, you cannot solve special tasks. And when we looked at this data using just this simple analysis of looking at the firing, whether the firing accumulates against the edges or not, we've seen that while in the wild type animals there is no accumulation of firing in the, at the edges of the environment, already in the young transgenic animals and more so in the aged transgenic animals, place cell firing accumulates at the edges. So this now suggests to me that uh, it's basically what's happening during this neurodegenerative process is kind of the inverse of what happens during development. And that now we have some, in some mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, you can see that given that, you know, uh, for some of these models, they recapitulate the fact that the deposition of tau, for instance, happens first in the entorhinal cortex, and this leads to grid cell, um, uh, grid cell uh, impairment. So maybe that's what we're seeing here. So the mice have lost grid cell uh, function, and again, when you lose grid cell function, you get place maps that are just skewed against the edges of the environment. So this is just convergent evidence that indeed, if you take away grid cell functioning, you end up with place maps that are uh, concentrated and work best just against prominent sensory inputs. So maybe that's what grid cells actually confer. And indeed, this is the, yeah. Yeah. So one thing that I should sorry clarify about this data is that we have we have controlled, of course, for the amount of time that the animals are uh, spending against the edges of the environment versus the center. So we co we have controlled for that, and in particular in the transgenic group uh, and the, sorry the transgenic and the wild type groups they spend the same amount of time against the edges of the environment. They spend lots of time against the edges of the environment, both the wild type and, and the transgenic. So this doesn't seem to be what is causing this skew in the map. And by the way, we've done lots and lots of controls also in terms of the, uh, where the, our pups dwell on the, in, in, in the environment. So that doesn't seem to drive this, okay? For the humans, it might be different. Uh, that's why I say I, I don't know. I don't know which way this, a relationship works and whether there is a direct uh, relationship, I cannot comment on that. But from our data, I can be pretty confident that it is not the, the, the way in which the animals sample the environment. Yeah? Because we can look for it. Uh, okay, and also, by the way, the relationship between boundary firing and the hippocampal plaques approaches significance, but just. Okay. Uh, so in terms of the conclusion for this little uh, story about place cell development, place cell maps are more stable close to the boundaries in this kind of square environments before winning. And uh, we think that maybe this is due to the fact that the, the firing of these cells is supported by the boundary cells. Now, what is in turn that supports boundary responses in early development we need to study. And so we're looking precisely at whisking and other uh, sensory uh, cues. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is that the emergence of grid cells uh, around P21 coincides with the, this uh, shift, which is quite abrupt, 
Okay? And again, I draw your attention on abrupt shifts in development, which are always interesting to me. Uh, this is an abrupt shift that coincides with P21 with the appearance of grid cells. So maybe this kind of data is telling us what grid cells might be doing, not only in development, but also uh, in, in the adult. And, and of course, it adds to the, the kind of evidence you are talking about, pharmacological and other evidence that tells us a little bit about the interrelationships between grid cell and place cells. Okay, so how am I doing for time? Because I have no idea what Great. to... Okay. No, no worries. Okay. So, head direction cells. No, but I don't want but to no, one tax... question. Yeah. So, your conclusion here is to show, look, there's a strong link to these boundary cells we found in subiculum and enterhinal. Yeah. Right? But then, to what extent... This is just suggestive, yeah? yeah? And it's an interpretation, and it's until we do the, the experiments where we silence, the boundary cells specifically, and that's difficult to do, and see what happens to the place right. cells, we, we cannot talk about it. So but it's an interpretation. The, the place cells are still distinguishable from these boundary cells, because they might sort of copy the boundary cell response. I know, because if you see, just at the very kind of qualitative level, if you look at one of these boundary cells, they, they fire all along one boundary, okay? Mm -hmm. Instead, the place cell will always have a discrete field that doesn't span the whole of the... Okay. Just at the qualitative level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so now let's look at the development of head direction cells, which, by the way, are, are interesting because, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, they're the first one to appear. So when you record, and this is work done by Hui Min Tan and Josh Bassett in my lab, uh, the activity of these head direction cells in the presubiculum here and in the anterior thalamus here uh, of uh, young animals. So what Josh and Hui Min managed to do is record the activity of these cells in animals that are very young. These are 12 days old animals. They can hardly move. And yet you can see that there is, uh, these are just examples of different head direction cells and how stable they are. It's the same as we've shown for place cells, but these are polar plots where the firing of the cell is uh, expressing polar coordinates. So you can see that when the animals are 16 days old, at least in the anterior thalamus, you can see they look exactly the same as in the adult. Yeah, they work really, really well. And here are the quantitative population data that shows uh, the both the percentage of head direction cells and their stability in both brain areas, in blue the presubiculum and in red is the anterior thalamus, uh, at different time points during development, and in particular we're expressing this time with respect to when the animals open their eyes. And if you look here carefully, uh, in, at times when the animals uh, have their eyes still closed, minus one, so they, one day before opening, two days and three days before opening, this dotted line represents the chance level, and also this is true of here. So there is a core network of head direction cells which has developed in the absence of vision, but this, uh, so there is a little core thing, but these are much less stable than when vision is um, appears, yes, when they open their eyes. So before I opening the head direction cells, head direction cells can develop in the absence of visual inputs, and this is interesting, uh, but they, they are less stable than when the animals open their eyes. And indeed, eye opening is followed by this rapid maturation, both in the number of cells that can be classified as head direction cells, but also in the, their, um, their stability. So it is in, what, yeah. Sorry, yeah. No, no, absolutely, uh, yeah. Uh, could you comment, sorry, just on two, two questions, I think. One is, what, do you find any difference in, the, in terms of the locomotory behavior of the animals prior to eye opening? There is no, no sharp transition, also because uh, in terms of how much they use vision at the beginning, uh, it, is, it is not very clear because their vision is completely, it is very poor at the beginning and it is kind of gradually developed. So we cannot see an incredible transition. And animals are generally tigmotactic. I mean, uh, pups are tigmotactic throughout the, um, the development. So what we see is that actually they, they start moving a bit slower maybe after uh, vision ensues for a little while, and then uh, uh, they start walking again faster after winning. So it's a bit like there is an inverse U curve in terms of the speed. Mm -hmm. But in terms of where they dwell in the environments, it's not so clear that there is a dis that vision does anything specific. Right. No, I was asking yeah. if that would be a source of, you know, minimizing errors 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, 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 that's why. So we've looked at this. It's a very good question, but uh, we cannot see anything obvious that... that. So what we know is that as soon as the eyes are opened, within 24 hours, head direction cells can follow visual cues. Okay, can be... So if you rotate a piece of white card, uh, the head direction cells, you can control the orientation of the head direction uh, circuit, like you would do in the adult. And this is very rapid, within 24 hours of the, this poor vision in Swain. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of which came first, right. I would guess that nobody think knows about speed cells, but I would guess that they're there uh, very early because I think they're just theta cells, what people in the 60s and 50s called theta cells. Uh, and uh, so those ones will be there very early because theta is already there in very young animals, very, very young animals, okay? So you don't need any kind of spatial uh, processing as such to support that kind of thing. Then the head direction cells, this is the data. I mean, the head direction cells are the first ones. And then there will be place cells and then grid cells. And if you think about the very old kind of story about uh, um, ontogeny recapitulates evolutionary history, okay? So although now we know that uh, like, uh, the evolution of the brain is quite a complex story, but you can see that head direction cells, which, have, which are also present in brainstem areas, mid-brain areas, all these kind of, let's say, ancient, in inverted commas, structures, are already there very early on. So they're the first. And then the grid cells, which are instead in the neocortical area, are the last, okay? Because the cortex is developed later, let's say, but although now it's a bit controversial, this statement, but in any case, so maybe it is true that at least for this system, the head direction cells which are also present in midbrain, hypothalamus, are already there earlier than the grid cells which are in the cortex. This is anterior cortex. Uh, no, this is presubiculum and thalamus, anterior thalamus. In red, all the anterior thalamus. Okay. Yeah. But they seem to develop, no, they don't develop in an equal way, right? Uh, the, so yes, the presubiculum lags a bit behind. The presubiculum is a very visual area. So it's the only place in the hippocampal system that receives direct visual information. That's why I was interested in looking at this area and contrasting it with the thalamus. They're two different bits. And in the adult, would yeah. then the, the subiculum show a similar prominence of the head direction cells as in the thalamus? Uh, in terms of totally? the percentages, yeah. no. It's very difficult to do this game, to play this game with the extracellular recording, okay? Because we don't have a way of, we cannot listen to cells which are silent, right? Uh, we cannot tell they're there. But uh, in, uh, in the adult, 50%, up to 50% of, uh, of th thalamic neurons are head direction cells, presubiculum 15, 20%, yeah? So there. But would it be fair then to say that what we look at here are visually driven head direction cells? Okay, because now we'll see. Okay. Yeah, okay, okay, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, we'll see what would drive, because that's what I'm interested in as well. So the questions you ask are the questions I really like. I mean, it, don't just show me plots here. I want to know what drives these cells, what makes this representation, what would this, this thing possible. Okay, so uh, Josh Bassett had this idea of looking whether, so vision is important to stabilize head direction cells, but it's not necessary. And why is it interesting, this question? Because vision, in terms of modeling um, the development of a direction cells, there are just a couple of models, and they've all invoked the presence of a supervisory uh, input that is a visual stimulus that is present at infinity and that you can, you can use to train the, the network. And why is that uh, the easiest way of doing this? Because, of course, you, you know, I mean, even sailors and so on and so forth, in, in order to know uh, your, um, the, the direction you're facing, in a cue that is far, far away from you is much more informative than a cue that is close by and you can walk around. Okay? It's much more difficult to extract allocentric direction from proximal cues than from distal cues. So that's why many people think that vision, even in rodents that are so, such non-visual animals, is a privileged sense to develop head direction cells. So it's interesting to see that in development, it's, vision is not necessary. 
okay, to develop allocentric uh, directional responses. So what Josh set out to do is precisely, so Josh has done lots of work with Jeff Taube, who is the person who's worked a lot on head direction cells, and he came to my lab and he wanted to look at these early responses uh, of head direction cells. And what he did is that instead of just putting animals in this standard box, which is 62 centimeters side, these are 13 days old animals, and here we selected the cells that are not really showing uh, head direction selectivity, and then he put them in the smaller box. And as you can see, lo and behold, these cells, which didn't show any kind of directional selectivity, show beautiful directional selectivity in the smaller box. Uh, and then, of course, if you put them back in the standard box, this disappears. So this trick of putting them in a small box pulls out directional selectivity, and it works at all ages, except for when animals are very, very young, okay, when they're 12 days old. So what this data, this is now the directional tuning, and this is the percentage of head direction cells. What this data tells us is that uh, other sensory channels, other than vision, because of course these animals are basically pre-visual, right? They, they are two, three days even before uh, opening their eyes. Other sources of information, possibly uh, whisker or tactile, uh, are supporting a direction firing here in these animals. But again, in this kind of animals, 12 days old, look how uh, sweet and small they are, uh, they, they, there is no improvement. Even if you put them in a small box, this, the, this trick doesn't work. Okay, so what have we learned about the basic uh, network properties of these cells from studying development? If you look at adult head direction cells and you record them, basically uh, in the adult, whenever you record two or more head direction cells, no matter what you do to the animal, uh, you, you disorient it, you make it drunk, you, whatever you want to do, you spin it around like crazy, you make it nauseous, the, the offset between head direction cells will always be preserved, okay? between co-recorded direction cells. So they're rigidly coupled, these different cells. And this is thought to reflect the network topology, the way in which these cells are wired together in this uh, structure that then uh, makes arise the attractor dynamics, okay, makes possible attractor dynamics. So what happens in terms of, can we look at this phenomenon in young animals? Yes, we can. We can just put animals in differently shaped environments. This is just an easy way of resetting the head direction system. And when you do this in animals that are post vision or at the onset of vision, uh, the spatial response, the head direction cells are already rigidly coupled as soon as vision uh, is present. Okay. Now, the interesting question is, uh, is this property really truly reflecting the way in which this wiring, uh, the, the cells are wired together? And if that is the case, you would expect this property to be present even before the cells are stabilized by any sensory cues. Okay? And that's why what we did was to look at um, basically the temporal relationship between firing of co-recorded uh, co head direction cell pairs, okay? So this is just temporal cross correlograms between, let's say we've recorded three cells and we put them in the small box and in the standard box and we're looking at the temporal relationship between firing of cell A versus B, B versus C or A versus C, okay? We can do it with many cells. And as you can see in the small box where the cells are spatially stable, there is no wonder that cells that have similar preferred heading direction have a peak, temporal peak of activity around zero, while the ones which are offset by 180 degrees, they have a kind of trough here. But is this true also in the standard box? So are the temporal relationship, is the temporal relationship between firing of these cells preserved when the network is not displaying directional selectivity. Yes, okay, so the, the basically the head direction cells uh, display the same kind of temporal relationship in their firing co-recorded head direction cells at the population level or even when you look basically at examples of this. So even when the head direction cell, yeah? Uh, we, we're talking uh, P14 here as well? We're talking even P12. We're talking throughout the whole uh, right. time, and yeah? Here the box is big, it's a large box. So that's really surprising, right? Because like at P14 you have A and A prime and you have like first a good directional tuning of the cell and not only that they are stable across the Yeah, this is after they are, um, uh, they, they can see. Yeah, they're visual right. animals. So yeah. if you go now one slide before 
Yeah. Yeah. We have like these two same standard bots. Let's call them A and A prime again. No, no, I, uh, yes, I was confused because I've literally, okay, I've, select, I've shown you here in the population level, okay, here. Yeah, if you look at, this is, this would be P14, okay, this would be P13, P12, okay. Even at P13, you can see some cells that are kind of directionally stable, relatively directionally stable, okay. So it depends which examples you choose to display, yeah, but here. Um, yes, as you can see here, in terms of relatively sharp, yeah, in terms of both of stability in the anterior thalamus, relatively sharp, and also number of cells, relative, yeah. So yes, vision represents, onset of vision represents this kind of transition. Okay, so the temporal relationship is already preserved even when they're drifting, these are direction cells. But also if we look at the spatial relationship of firing, as you can see here, we can just look, so we, if we record cell A, okay, in this small box, and then we see if we put all the spikes that cell A is fired uh, at zero here, where does cell B fire within a 10 second time window, you can see that cell B fires at a, a spatial, fixed spatial offset with respect to A, not only in the small box, and we know this because of course cell A and cell B display nice um, directional uh, plots uh, in the small box, but also when the cells are drifting. So when there is no apparent directional stability in the cells, the network is shifting or drifting or moving in concert. All the cells are doing it together, okay? Spatially and temporally. And uh, of course we can look at several co-recorded cells, but what's more interesting is that this is also true in animals that are 12 days old. So these are animals that are so young that Josh hasn't found a trick to stabilize this, this representation. So even in an animal where presumably there has never been experience of stable head direction cells, already the cells appear to be really um, coupled together, which argues that maybe McNaughton was right about the idea that this property comes straight away from the wiring between the cells, which is already in place by these ages, because this has happened during uh, embryonic development actually, the wiring, it's already all there. Okay, so, but, this yeah. Is, this is tubicular. Uh, anterior thalamus. This is all this anterior is all thalamus. thalamus. This is all thalamus, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. okay, and this is all, uh, um, I mean. So mm. then your claim would be that uh, the, 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 what you call the tractor dynamics yeah. is, is wired in the thalamus itself. It's a thalamic property. Uh, people would say that it's even lower down in the lateral mammillary nuclei, nucleus. But it's not, there is no experimental evidence. But the idea okay. is that it's between the, the lateral mammillary nucleus and the DTN in the brainstem. Yeah? And do you know if for the grid cells someone has looked at something similar? Yes, we have. I will show you the slide. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. But now there's, there's a little trick uh, issue. You speak of a tract of the, oh, your data seems to show that these cells are correlated in their response. Mm. Right, but to have an attractor means that you have things like pattern completion, you have rapid yeah. transitions, and so on. Are you gonna look at that? Yes, but I cannot answer in a very, very yes for place cells. No, I'm, no for the head for, direction cells. For this, no. I, for the head direction cells, no, mm -hmm. not yet. I, I can show you what uh, I can show you, but pattern completion. I don't think anybody has looked at pattern completion for head direction cells. So I'm saying to yeah. speak of an attractor. Yeah has certain implications. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. Right? And yeah. then, of course, if you want, like to call this head direction system uh, being based on the ring attractor, mm -hmm. as McNaughton would suggest, then you have to show, satisfy those criteria. Mm -hmm. And that we haven't really done so far. What we saw so far shows they're, they're correlated in their yeah. response. Yeah, but even in the adult, nobody has ever looked at, yes. Exactly. No. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So how would you test pattern completion in a head direction uh, network? Well, yeah, for you have to find a way to have relatively large jumps yes. in either optic flow or yes. in the autolytes. Yeah. We're working on that okay. with virtual reality. That's exactly the kind of mm. works that we want to do now. Because right. before it's, because you need to exactly mm, uh, have a linear change in a variable mm -hmm. and see that instead you have a sudden transition in go. the network. Exactly yes, absolutely. Right. And that's, that's precisely why we're interested in virtual reality. And Neil presented some mm -hmm. data. Yeah, okay. This Very is work to yet to come though. Mm -hmm. I cannot 
produce it here. No, not yet. Okay. Come back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what we've done here is to try and understand now. So now we know that they're all kind of doing stuff together, these direction cells. But what are they doing when they're not displaying stable head direction uh, responses? What are they doing? What is the network doing? And what we do, what, what we can do is by uh, use standard kind of uh, Bayesian decoding to look at what the network is, uh, what kind of answer the network is producing. And uh, first, I'm just showing you uh, 300 uh, seconds uh, of an animal walking around, okay, this is time, and he, this is the actual uh, heading direction that the head of the animal took at any given time, okay? So this is the path of where it turned its head. And we can use the firing of the cells in the small box, okay, to just see whether we can decode the, head, the actual heading uh, direction of the animal. And no wonder this works really well. This is just uh, uh, a little bit of um, an, an exercise to convince you that our decoding can work in a situation in the small box where we know the head direction cells produce very beautiful, stable directional responses. So we can decode the actual uh, heading direction of the animal on the basis of the firing of these cells. Now, can we, w when we try and do the same exercise using the firing, so using the uh, offsets in the actual small box, but using the firing from the large box where there is no, f no kind of spatial st uh, directional stability, what does it look like, the response of the network? So this is the actual heading direction of an animal that uh, walked around for five minutes. And let's see what the decoding tells us. So for ease of interpretation, I've chosen an example where the decoded uh, heading direction starts in the same place as the uh, the actual heading direction. But what you see is that s rapidly these lines drift apart and basically they're not parallel to each other. So which tells us that there is, a, that the network, first of all, the fact that these lines are continuous tell us that the network is not jumping from one heading direction to another in a kind of random or sudden fashion, but rather that it is uh, sweeping through the different heading directions like an attractor would do, okay? So it's not, I mean, attractor could do either thing, but the, what's happening here is that it's sweeping through all the different heading direction. And the other thing is that there is an accumulation of error, okay? And if you just do, this is heading direction, if you do the first derivative, you look at angular head velocity now, you can see that the decoded angular head velocity is always under signaled, basically, with respect to the actual head velocity. So maybe this is what's happening in the young animals. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go back. <coughs> in the small box, how, how many body lengths would be one side of your small box? 20 centimeters, okay. three, four, <coughs> yeah, five even, of the small so animals. It doesn't travel. Okay. Yeah, 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 yes, okay. yes, yes. And then when the they're in the center, they cannot feel anything. <coughs> so you, you train the decoding system on data you got both in the small and the standard box? So we get the, the offsets between cells mm -hmm. from the small box because we assume that that offset is going to be preserved in the large box on the basis of the data before, right? Is that a reasonable assumption? Be because we've just shown here that these offsets are stable, yeah? So you can use those. Uh, or at least you could use those. And the fact that you get something that resembles something useful and not completely random uh, so you're saying kind of support. For instance, it's not impossible that even those pups would use some estimate of scale to, let's say, rescale their uh, estimates of head direction, let's say. Yeah, yeah. So if you would do your, if you would train your encoder and decoder in the standard box, your claim would be it will come out exactly the same. Uh, yes, the problem is that I cannot do it, so I cannot prove that, right? Because I don't know the offsets. There is no way for me of knowing the offsets of the thing, if not extracting them from when they're stable. Well, in, the, in the standard box, you could just measure it and then uh, learn to encode position from the, or orientation from the head direction from that response, and then use that as your decoder, no? But I wouldn't know which number to assign to to it, right? I wouldn't know each cell when it fires in a specific, like, 
which orientation to attribute the one to the you observe. the one I observe. Yeah, the animal is okay, so in that case, what will happen is what we can see here. Yeah. That's your prediction. Yeah. But you see the tiny differences. Yeah. It might show scaling. If you go back. Yeah. I which one? Which one? Which one? Look! 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 It's into it's here. No, no, on the slide, one slide back. Okay. Yeah. You see, if you look at the bottom plot, yes, it's correlated, but there seems to be some scaling effect, you see? So the which one? This one? At the bottom, from, from yes. Yeah. Yes, you see? mean it's, it's a less and, and stable, and yeah, because be I think this is because it's 10 seconds time window. So if you do 20 seconds, it's larger even, yeah? No, but it means there is some scaling effect if you go between these two boxes. There is some modulation. And that might just be enough modulation to, 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 to overcome this difference you, that you now call. You mean the width here yeah. is larger mm -hmm. than yes. the big box. Yeah. Yes, but if I integrate five seconds across five sorry uh, seconds or 20 seconds, the scaling changes, and yet I'm, already, I'm always in the standard box. Mm -hmm. So I think this is just noise. The more I add time, the more there is noise, and that's why I have a wider thing there. Yeah, because uh, if it was the scaling, this should stay the same no matter how much time I'm integrating across, right? Well, but in both cases, you're in trouble then. Why? Because then you say, well, the difference that you observe here is noise, but you haven't proven that to us. Yes. The, alter the alternative interpretation is they're scaling, and then you have a problem with the next But scaling, slide. you mean that the, uh, the firing in the, small, in the bigger box would be wider yeah. than in the small box. Exactly, and that would then account for the difference you show on the next slide, or partially. But why would it, be, yes, no, tell me why it would be directional in this directional effect in the sense that it's always an under uh, um, for signaling. For reasons that right now we, we cannot, I mean, I can speculate on that, but for, for now we don't really uh, and then we need to inc to to uh, call up the, the usual kind of Occam's razor thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you you need to invoke several unknown reasons, then well, the, the point yeah. is what I'm claiming is, yeah. is, is that there's one thing you didn't check mm -hmm. that there might be a scaling factor if I move from small to big. Okay. Right, and that by magic the animal can estimate that. So the problem is that I cannot do the decoding just that's on the you, basis of yeah. Exactly, that's your that's, practical problem. Yeah, uh, yes. But my hypothesis is still reasonable. Yeah, and given okay. this hypothesis, I can then account for that for the difference. I'm not. I'm not sure you would. You I'm saying would it's an come artifact up. of the decoder you used. Okay. Therefore, right. It's an artifact of using a decoder that's tuned to the small box that doesn't take into account the scaling. Okay. You will observe in the big box. So you think you would, if imagine there is a scaling, you would see this systematic under signaling yeah. of exactly. the angular head velocity. It's a possibility. Okay, so why do we get, uh, um, never mind the scaling, why do we get the drift there in the, small, in the big box? If it was just a matter of scaling, we should still get them uh, being, like the place fields indeed, mm -hmm. you will get some wider uh, responses, you but... You have drift because of the interaction between the movements of the animal and an error in scaling from the small box. And you interpret it as drift, but uh, actually it's just a reconstruction error. Okay, but the error in scaling is specifically happening in the larger box, and why would that be? What would because cause? Your is wrong. No, no, no. I, I, the fact that I don't get stable head direction cells, I don't need any decoder. I just look at this. I just look at this and say there is huge problem. I don't have any kind of stable heading direction. So that's my question. So what is accounting for this drift? For the difference between the two. Yes. Why is in this case? Oh, we noise, get this. Let's say that is noise in distal processing of the, the pup's perceptual system. Yes. And all I'm showing with this decoder is that I think that that noise results in under signaling of angular head velocity, mm -hmm. specifically in the standard box. So my only claim is that whatever is like these this problems with sensory processing result specifically in under signaling of angular head velocity in the standard box, in the larger box, and that's, that's just my claim, that we know that mm -hmm. what's happening is that there is this systematic under-signaling of angular head velocity that is causing this dramatic drift specifically in the standard box. Mm -hmm. And when you give enough sensory cues, so smaller box, you overcome, you basically reset more often, you can reset more often this angular head velocity drift, and so you can correct it appropriately. So that's my small claim. I'm not making huge claims. 
I'm just saying that we can see how the sensory um, inability of resetting sensory information uh, is causing the drift through angular head velocity misreading. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Just yeah, no, 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 I'm, no, I'm just okay. saying, yeah, 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 no, no, indeed, indeed. I'm just uh, saying what, what I think our data tells. But then the, the effect you see in the standard box. So this is the uh, this is the systematic under signaling that you don't see. You see a little bit of, but not so much in the small box. But it's systematic, right? Yes, hmm? yes, I know it yeah. is systematic. Yes, that's why it's interesting. If it was just a scaling factor, I wouldn't expect it to be systematic. But that would be like a local noise. Ah no, yes, mm -hmm. no, absolutely. Right. And I think that's why this this kind of suggests that. There is indeed a problem with the vestibular integration, and that's what we're looking at now in these young animals. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and that if you don't overcome it, you cannot overcome it with sensory reset. Then you you have tragic loss of directional selectivity. That's what we think this data is telling us okay. to look at the vestibular system, basically. Okay, and this to answer the question about the grid cells. So uh, grid cells have been thought, like a direction cells, to be wired as a kind of continu continuous attractor networks. It's just a two-dimensional um, uh, expansion of the one-dimensional uh, model by McNaughton. Uh, and then there are lots and lots of different models, right? Not just um, McNaughton's one. So what can we say about whether a tractor network kind of connectivity exists in the earliest grid cell networks? Of course, until we do uh, two photon imaging, which we're trying and eventually will manage to do, what we can we, we cannot tell before we see stable grid cells which cells we are going to be grid cells. Okay. So let's say on day P22 we have some grid cells. We don't know the same cells in P21 what they were doing. So we cannot play the same game we've played with head direction cells. We cannot tell whether there is an attractor connectivity or whether these cells are drifting together before they are stabilized with respect to the rest of the room cues. Uh, but what we could do in animals that already displayed stable grid cells, this is an animal which is P22, uh, so 22 days old, we put them in different environments and then we do the cross correlogram between these patterns of activity, these are three different cells. And as you can see, basically the offset between the cells is preserved in any given environment you, you throw at the animal. This is the same as you would expect in the, in the adult. Uh, so basically simultaneously recorded cells, the offset between the phase offset between the cells is maintained constant as soon as we can see stable grid cells. So this argues for the fact that they, they're already arranged in this kind of att attractor topology, perhaps. But we cannot, again, we cannot do the same game we've done with that direction cells. So this is, yeah? Uh, where among the bus objects are you recording? So we were recording, this is entoranal cortex, pretty dorsal, actually. So we weren't looking at many modules. This is work uh, that has already been published in 2012, so many years ago. And we haven't looked again more ventrally, because it would be interesting to see across modules. Yeah, and I, I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. OK, so this is the uh, recap for the head direction development. So visual cues are required for other uh, like head direction responses uh, in, uh, they're required to stabilize them, but the core uh, direction circuit can be built without visual um, information. And that we think that the head direction network drift before uh, eye opening is due to this under signaling of angular head velocity, but that this attractor network topology might be already present uh, even before the cells are stabilized, the representations can be stabilized to the outside world, which suggests that they're not extracting this property from the regularities of the environment. And also, like for head direction cells, the last slide is that for grid cells as well, but this is only, only applies to when the grid cells are already stable, they are already locked together. Now, I don't want to bore everybody. I have another bit about the development of memory processing, but really we need to take a poll of whether I should continue or not. And I'm totally happy with not continuing because. Let's hear about memory processing. Oh, it's cool. Hmm? Okay. Uh, I know. I will be, maybe I will be very, very brief. I won't, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, given that you are uh, looking at these developments of uh, cortex, here we are assuming that it somehow hardwired these. 
Yes. Yes. So this is exactly the kind of stuff that we're doing now. So you will have seen the paper by Busaki about how adult head erection cells and in sleep, right? So we assume that they're already working, already exactly, even in, because if in wakefulness, when they're drifting, they are drifting together, there is no reason to think that in sleep they would just break down. But it is an interesting question, and indeed that's what we're, we're doing now, to do recordings, yeah. Okay, so very, very quickly, I will go through this at the speed of light, and then we, we can talk about it uh, later if you want to talk about this. So we can look a little bit, and this is in a very limited way, at the memory functions of the hippocampus looking at place cells through this phenomenon of remapping. So when you put animals, let's say, in a square box, uh, you get a map a set of place cells that fire in specific locations. When you put them then in another shape, in a differently shaped box, after some no. time, the, you can train the network uh, to distinguish between these two boxes, okay? And what's more, if you then take away the animal from these two boxes for months, two months, three months, and then you put the animals back in, the animal back in the box, the hippocampus will pull out different maps for the square and the uh, cylinder. So the, uh, it can work as a memory system. You've trained the network to distinguish between these two inputs and it produces two different outputs, even after a gap in experiencing this. Okay, now we're talking about what an attractor network, if, the, if, if it is true that the hippocampus works as an associative network, according to what, uh, like what a Hopfield network would go do, what, how can you test this, okay? One way of testing this has been done in 2005 in John O'Keefe's lab by Tom Wills and other people, including myself. Basically what you do is that once you've established two different representations, one in the square and one in the cylinder, you feed the network that you've trained to distinguish between the square and the cylinder there, uh, a linear change between square and cylinder, so intermi geometrically intermediate shapes as much as you can in the real world, and this was physical boxes, no virtual reality then, uh, so intermediate linearly, you change one variable linearly, and an attractor network, what sh it should do is instead of producing a linear output, it should have the sigmoid transition from one to another uh, representation. This is the hallmark, the litmus test. And so this is indeed what happened uh, that uh, whenever you put animals in these intermediate shapes, the hippocampus pulled out either, pulled up either the square representation or the cylinder representation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is it really a sigmoid or is it just a, a jump? It, it's, uh, experimentally it's just a jump, okay? Then, uh, I mean, that's, that's what we saw. We saw, and the jump is here, appears between these shapes, okay? It's a sudden transition between when the hippocampus thinks that this intermediate shape is just a square and this one instead is just a cylinder, yeah? Okay. So in the pup, in order to run this experiment, you need to have the animals out for four hours, five hours, running all these things in the same, at the same time. We cannot do this with the rat pup because you cannot separate them from the mother, otherwise you stress them and then the whole trajectory of hippocampal development, you, you're changing it and so wh why are you doing this? So the only way to look for pattern separation and pattern completion, these two processes in the hippocampus that we found, and this is uh, kind of, uh, we had to make do with our model system, is to have a much simpler uh, design, experimental design. So first we put animals in familiar environments and then we put them in completely novel environments. The shape is the same, but the material and the, the uh, distal cues are completely different across these two things. And you can see in animals that are 18 days old or even younger, the hippocampus can pull up different maps, okay, uh, for the novel and familiar. And what's more, uh, if you put animals twice in a novel environment, uh, and you put them back in the familiar environment, they, the, you, you can get place maps 
that are basically faithfully reproducing these two different environments. Okay, this is like the square and the circle. So basic, but this is basic and I cannot even call it true pattern separation, but remapping can be observed in animals that are as young as 16 days old. Okay, so the hippocampus can produce several different maps when you put animals. Or this is CA1. This is CA1. Yeah, and also before it was CA1, yeah? We didn't okay. record CA3. But Loigabs have done in CA3 and it works just fine. Uh, so in terms of pattern completion, to test the, the, the possibility of pattern completion, what we did, we couldn't do the clean experiment of changing one variable linearly and incrementally. And so what we've done is a different one where we, because of time constraints, what we've done, we have put the animals in a familiar environment, then we change just one feature, the walls of the environment. And as you can see, the network doesn't distinguish between these two environments. It thinks that they're the same. Then we change just the floor. And again, the, the, the hippocampus doesn't think that the environments are different. But lo and behold, when you change both the floor and the walls, there is remapping, you induce remapping. So this tells us that A, the hippocampus is not insensitive to changing just the floor or the walls. And therefore it tells you that when the hippocampus pulls up the same map, it's doing something akin to pattern completion. You're giving the, uh, you're feeding the hippocampus an environment which is basically like the familiar one, except that it lacks one of the cues. Okay, so it's doing cue completion. And it's saying, okay, it looks close enough, and so I'll pull up the same map. So even in animals that are 16 days old, this, uh, the hippocampus already displays the kind of key signatures of an associative network. And again, this suggests that people are right in thinking that it is the wiring, and in particular the recurrent connectivity of CA3, that might be supporting both pattern completion and pattern separation. And again, I have to be very cautious about what I say, because our data goes just a little way towards demonstrating this, but not all the way. Okay, and one very last slide about replay activity in young animals. So we know in the adult, when you put an animal, let's say in this case, the animal is running along a linear track, okay, linear trajectory corridor going up and down this track. And when the animal is awake, you see a sequence of play cells, different colors represent different, play, uh, different cells, pyramidal cells firing at different locations. Uh, now, both when the animal is quiet, either at the edges of the environment or even when it's running, but just during brief pauses. What happens is that in the, the hippocampus, instead of displaying theta oscillation, which is this 10 hertz oscillation that you see, humming all the neurons humming together at 10 hertz, when the animal runs, you see theta. When the animal stops briefly, you see these ripples, sharp wave ripples emerging. And these sharp wave ripples are just another mode of functioning of the hippocampus. And while this happens, Lo and behold, what you see is that the sequence of places that was played in real world where the animal was walking is replayed at much faster time scales, 10 times faster generally or more, uh, in during these brief periods when the ripple is happening. So there is this packet of information that uh, might be broadcast to the rest of the cortex or whatever. There is a theory by Busaki that that's what they're doing. That, that, that during ripple, what's happening is that the hippocampus is telling the rest of the brain what it has experienced, okay? And so it's feeding this sequence of events to the rest of the, of the brain. And also some people think that they're important for encoding, so on and so forth. So now let's see. These are animals now that do not display spatial navigation, do not display memory in the traditional sense. Do we see the signature of replay sequences in these young animals? And what we've done is you can see this not only when the animal pauses, but also during sleep, I should say, of the animal. So what we've done is that we've had the animal sleep, then we had the animal run in this kind of square environment just against the edges, like a, quad, a, like a square linear track. And these are all the cells that we record at the same time when one animal is running around here. And here, very quickly, is just to show you one example, and this is very preliminary data, of one such replay activity, okay? So uh, some of the cells that we're firing in this sequence, arm one, arm two, arm three, arm four, are faithfully replayed during the sleep of the animal, okay? And now we're doing the stats to see how robust the phenomenon is, but uh, I know like uh, the usual 
the popper thing, if you see a white swan or a black swan, I cannot remember, it means you may see others. So the fact that there is one of these events suggests that indeed... It's slow sleep. Ah, slow wave sleep, yeah. sleep, yes, slow wave sleep. We've done it just in, not, not in uh, like the ongoing, uh, yes, ripple, yeah. Okay, so there is some thing. So the important thing is that the question that stays, okay, we have the basic properties of an associative network, we have even replay now, but why is it that memory cannot be expressed behaviorally until these animals are 21 days or older? And also maybe, are these spatial signals stable across longer temporal gaps? So we've seen that within 10, 15 minutes, yes, but if you uh, stop, if you record in a square and then you put the animal in the same environment, let's say a day after or three days after or six or like uh, a week after, can the animals remember? So we're trying to understand whether we can get hold of the phenomenon that this episodic memory recollection is stronger in, in uh, young children uh, than when you ask an adult to recall episodic memories earlier. And so these are the open questions. Okay, and then I'll go very quickly. These are all things that I won't look at, but it's not data from my lab. To thank all the people in my lab, Josh Bassett, who worked on head direction cells, Fabio uh, and Lawrence Musig, who works on, worked on place cells, Hui Min and Jonas, who's now, who've now left the lab. I want to thank, of course, the founders, and I want to thank also the rats for their contribution. And most of all, I want to thank you for listening to this very long lecture, and to <laughs> thank you very much, and keeping away. Yeah. sharp waves. Uh, Can we go back to the slide, yeah? Yeah. So you, you mentioned it was related to, to experience of the, of the pup, but without uh, walking, right? Without moving, or is it? So, so the, the replay is happening while the pup is asleep yeah. in the box there during the sleep phase. Uh, but yes, the, uh, it is, does not happen pre-play. Like it, it is selectively present after the sleep after the run session and not in the previous. That's how you. So, so it is a replay of, a, of a an experience yes. trajectory. Yes, okay. an experience and trajectory. And in yes. indication of pre-play of. We haven't looked at that in any greater in great okay. depth or anything. So for now, we just wanted to establish the very basic kind of post experience phenomenon. Because for us, this is the puzzle, really. Why is it that you cannot get the behavioral level, these animals, to solve any of these tasks? Why cannot express, they cannot express any memory? And I think that all these phenomena here are kind of almost automatic processes of the hippocampus, but then there is something else that needs to kick in to, to make them kind of, to make the hippocampus a navigation machine, yeah? And then, then it is... I think the answer is not trivial as, okay, they cannot really walk or something. It's, it's something about the processing of the hippocampus that is still missing before winning. Hmm. Maybe it is the grid cells. I, I don't know. But, yeah. But you think it is a consolidation, as Buzaki, a consolidation mechanism? Or, or would it be also present in when the rats are just in, in mobile? Or is it also a retrieval mechanism? Yeah, so I, I don't know. I mean, my data doesn't speak towards that. So my data only speaks towards the fact that this basic phenomenon is present in very young animals. Now, what it means in an animal that cannot express any form of memory, it tells you that there is already a disconnection. So uh, this is possible. It could be a necessary, but it's not sufficient then to, to provide memory. So it's an, it could be necessary, but I, I cannot tell, okay? Uh, so the, in order to answer the question, as all the people who have done uh, like um, disruption of uh, ripples and SWRs, th that kind of data supports the view that it is indeed necessary to, for consolidation, for instance. But my data only tells you that it, it may be necessary, but definitely it's not sufficient to express memory because these animals do express replay, but they don't have yet uh, memory, spatial memory to speak of. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah? Other questions? Yeah. 
what do you mean they don't have special memories? Because like we can see these are very young know. animals. They can be 16 days old, or I mean, this I think was 16 days old. So yeah, if sure, you test them on any of the special memory, I'm talking about the behavioral level. So how do I know that an animal can remember something? I can tell what the network is doing, but that doesn't mean that the animal knows how to like solve a water maze task or any of these special tasks or any memory uh, tasks that we know uh, are uh, based on hippocampal functioning in the adult. Right, right. So that's what I mean by... But yeah. still taking on the previous question, like if you don't find sharp wave ripple events on the sleep prior to the experience of the box, and then you have place fields there, and then you see ripple. I, I didn't say I don't see them. I haven't looked for them, yes? Okay. I mean, what I'm saying is that okay. there is a differential. The way in which you look at ripple events, you just compare uh, the sequences. Uh, after and before sleep, because you could see just random replaying of things, right? So you need to right. be able to say that there is an enrichment of the sequences in the post-sleep than in the pre-sleep. Mm -hmm. And that, that's all I'm saying. I, I don't know whether there is pre-play. Right. Yeah. You have other questions? So the, for the head, so, okay, the important point here is the head direction system it's like really an anchor point to, to drive mm. the whole hippocampal circuit to mm. start to become a useful uh, spatial cognition machine. Um, but now, the data you present... But they didn't get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> you can, yeah. look, Maybe uh, next uh, one. Uh, exactly. Still Maybe young. next time. You're still young. No, 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 not me. No, no, me. This is... Uh, no, no, absolutely not me. This will be the people who have discovered that. No, no, don't worry. Yeah. Um, but, but the point is that... Um, so you have to have a lot of the data on the head direction system you now shared with us comes from the thalamus, right? So can you say something about first the, the, the developmental trajectory of how to bring those signals into entorhinal cortex? Mm -hmm. And then also whether in your mind entorhinal cortical uh, responses to heading direction or then also path integration are just copying this head direction response from the thalamus or do you believe that signal is further mm. ma ma manipulated or integrated yeah. or combined? Okay, this is these are all very interesting questions. So, uh, in terms of the development of how, I mean, the signal the signal is also present already in parahippocampus in presubiculum, the head direction cells. So it, during development as well. So I think this is a unitary phenomenon. Once you get uh, you get head direction cells in development in lower let's say areas. So. Uh, subcortical areas, you will also see them in the cortical areas at the same time, uh, roughly. Uh, and in terms of the relationship between, let's say, uh, Jeff Taube has done uh, experiments where you uh, silence head direction cells in the thalamus and you disrupt grid cells. So we know that the, the, if without, grid, uh, without head direction cells, you cannot have grid cells. Okay, this is the kind of causal uh, relationship. And then the last question was, about whether, whether the head direction response you now find in these hippocampal regions. Mm. Oh, yes, yes, is, yes. It's a further, let's say, enhancement, yeah. manipulation. Yeah. Okay, so uh, experimental data that speaks towards this question is coming from Kevin Allen's lab. It's still not uh, published, uh, but it's very interesting. He has found that when, so we have also found that when you put animals, mice, these are in the dark. Uh, grid cells kind of are disrupted. We found it and they found it as well. Now the interesting thing is that they're looking at the head direction cells and the, the grid cells that have conjunctive representations and they see that uh, while there is a core of head direction cells in the entorhinal cortex which behave like the ones I've, I've shown you here that they always are in sync, like in sync with each other, they're rigidly coupled, there is a subset of cells that had they display directional selectivity, but they're not kind of uh, part of this kind uh, this network. They seem to not be rigidly coupled. Okay, this is the first and only suggestion that there might be different kinds of head direction cells once you get into the entorhinal cortex, let's say, in cortical areas. And it's very, very intriguing and interesting. And I haven't seen the paper yet, but I mean, I'm very excited about these results because it would tell you indeed that some of these uh, head direction responses are further uh, kind of processed mm -hmm. once they get to the internal cortex. 
And that's very interesting. But otherwise, you would just think for all the other evidences that these, these are just reflecting head direction input mm -hmm. from lower areas. Don't be careful. Uh, head direction cells. You're young, you shouldn't be careful. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to say it all. Yeah. I, so when you are saying, you know, you disrupt head direction cells, uh, you, uh, like you're going to lose grid cells, so grid really depend on head direction. The problem with that statement is that grid depend on everything, you know, like, like you cut projection from CA1 back to entorinal, that is to say, like play cell signaling back to in yeah, entorinal and we're going to lose head, uh, grid cells. Okay, but then that's true also of the hippocampus. And when you do this kind of similar no, manipulation. I mean, you told me to not be careful. Okay. Um, no, 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 you shouldn't be careful <laughs> indeed. And that's why, that's right, why this that's is exactly fun, right? What, we need to discuss. What Gab Moser's uh, lesion studies show, right? That you don't, like play cells do not really depend on a specific kind of. Uh, cells in order to form and mm. their special, special... No, 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 yes, yes. So what I'm saying is that in terms of connectivity, okay, you wouldn't have thought that if you take away head direction cells in the thalamus, you get still what look like place cells and you don't get grid cells. Why is that? Why is that the place cells are selectively resilient and well, the grid well, cells are not? Well, my is that grid cells depend on everything, right? Yeah, 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 okay, I understand, but why? I mean, because, uh, like, you can we thought when the grid cells appeared, I remember, John, everybody like, like, oh yes, this is the metric, we found it, the Euclidean map, ah! Okay, <laughs> and, and, uh, and why is it that it's not so resilient as you're saying? Whatever you throw at these grid cells, they crumble. Right. Because, no, there's there an there's an easy answer to that, yes. Diogo. Okay. You should have known that, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, um, the, because the point is, the, the, the grid cells um, are a, a rather elaborate attractor network that follow a twisted torus topology, to, to mm -hmm. at least from a from a computational perspective, yes, yes. sense. And they integrate both feed forward and feedback uh, information coming out of this whole hippocampal loop. Okay. That, so that would make them extremely sensitive to any kind of noise. Okay, and right. the, the, so you think that the topology of the head direction system would be so much simpler and so that less is. less. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah, that's the claim. That would be okay. my claim, right? Okay. They're really they're integrative. That gives them this en enormous capability to become a metric, but as such, th they are s much more sensitive to noise in terms of setting up the topology because you must you must wire this twisted torus topology correctly, right? If you do if you if you screw that up. You screwed the rest of your life, you'll never be able to park your car anymore. Yes, and indeed we want we want some models of how you could wire this topology, biologically kind mm -hmm. of grounded. Right. Um, Absolutely, because that's where the, the whole complexity lies. I totally agree. And that's, that's the right. the interesting mm -hmm. bits are. But that's a hypothesis, right? Yeah. Why why it would follow late. Okay. Yeah. And what is the can I ask question? What is the experimental evidence that the grid cells do provide a metric? Now we are 12 years from the discovery, and it's a very early stages. The experimental evidence? Yes. Um, very I'm not, exactly, yeah. I'm not saying that they're not. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that we're very excited, and we keep being very excited, but not doing the right experiments yet. Right. But Somehow, all of us, including me, yeah? Sure. Yes. Now, there are plenty of, I mean. let's say, computational suggestions for models, mm. but the real, let's say, uh, empirical evidence, I think, it's, we're yeah. guessing. Right. Yeah, so it's down to the new generation, that's why I'm bringing this up, it's down to the new generations to do this to, from this experiment. It's, it's, we are trapped in believing our own kind of narratives without testing them. And I'm blaming myself as well with this, mm -hmm. yeah? So that's why it's interesting to talk to younger people to say, these are the questions that you need to attack. All right. Yeah, come out of the, of the cognitive map theory. Yes, just destroy us. <laughs> All right. Yeah? With okay. those words of self-destruction. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.